Man's dream of space travel began long ago. The triumphs of modern science and engineering stand on the shoulders of those who came before us hundreds of years ago. So this evening we will briefly recall the history of science in the late 17th and 18th centuries, a time called the Age of Enlightenment. This was a time of great change and progress. Bach and Mozart were setting new standards in musical composition. Politics and philosophy saw the American and French revolutions. Newton invented calculus and celestial mechanics, the tools for space navigation. And a host of chemists emerged from the ignorance of alchemy to develop the scientific method of theory and proofs that shapes our modern knowledge of energy and matter. Among these great minds of the Age of Enlightenment is Woburn-born Benjamin Thompson, later called Count Rumford. The son of a North Woburn farmer, Benjamin had a talent for detailed observation and the ability to interpret his observation as laws of Newtonian physics. Since the time of the Greek philosopher Aristotle, who once declared that everything was made up of only four elements, earth, air, water, and fire, heat was thought to be a physical element present in various amounts in all objects. It was Thomson who declared that Aristotle and his 18th century followers of the caloric theory were wrong. He, he declared, was not an element but a form of energy. And energy could take on different forms and be itself transformed. Thomson was the father of the science we call thermodynamics, the study of heat, its behavior, and the transformation of energy from one form to another. Thomson's declarations and proof provided by others in the Age of Enlightenment allowed future generations of scientists and inventors to better understand the nature of our physical world and to create the machines and processes we enjoy today. This, of course, includes the space shuttle and all the industry and knowledge needed to build and support such an advanced craft. Thompson's second wife was Marie Lavoisier, the widow of the famous French chemist Antoine Lavoisier. The Lavoisiers carried out very carefully measured experiments on water, metals, and metal ores. Their work and calculations gave physical proof of Thomson's theories. Madame was herself a brilliant mind who taught herself chemistry and was so adept at absorbing technical concepts that she was the chief French to English and English to French translator of complex technical journals. She was a translator, assistant, scribe, and illustrator of complex equipment and experiments for both her famous scientist husbands. She has been called the first woman of modern chemistry. Tonight, with the help of the reenactors from the Woburn Historical Society's Living History Guild, student assistants, and the computer magic of plasma films, we will offer a short program on the history of this age and the parts played by Woburn's Count Rumford and Madame Lavoisier. <laughs> I am at a time in my life where a man looks back at his accomplishments and indiscretions. Reflecting on my boyhood in the rough fields and waters of Woburn and my lifelong friendship with Loami Baldwin, how I do miss him in the innocent nature of that time and place. What might he and the citizens of that hamlet remember of me, perhaps the only native son declared a count of the Holy Roman Empire? Now as fate would have it, I found myself in the court of Carl Theodore, the Duke of Bavaria. Having my worldly needs well secured, and a beautiful wife who also dwells in the sciences, I had the luxury of exploring the great questions of this time. Madame Lavoisier was also fluent in French as well as English, and soon I was in correspondence with men of prominence of all tongues and disciplines. But as my boyhood teacher John Fowle once said, Discussions frequently degenerate into arguments, but I get too far ahead now. While at the military arsenal in Munich, I was observing a cannon being bored under a water bath. The technique is to use a large, fast-moving drill to bore a hole in a solid rod of metal. The heat produced was so intense as to make the water boil, and the chips of machined metal were even hotter than the boiling water. I asked myself, from whence comes the heat actually produced in this mechanical operation? Is it furnished by the metallic chips which are separated by the bore from the solid mass of metal? This was the explanation offered by the idea of phlogiston, 
that an element of heat pre-exists in the metal itself and that it was merely spilling out. However, if the drill was too dull to remove any material, the heat will still be generated as long as the drill was rotating. Heat produced in this manner was inexhaustible and not limited to the amount of material present. Clearly the heat was not in the metal, but was being generated by the motion of the drill. I further dismissed phlogiston being present in the body of the cannon, since its presence in so large an observed amount would cause the cannon to always be white hot in its normal state. I came to the conclusion, which was later supported by experiments and measurements, that the motion of the drill was being transformed into heat, and that heat was just another form of energy. Those that came after me were able to develop the formulae for these transformations of energy. I published my observations, but I still had non-believers. We, Monsieur Kirwan, still insisted that Fulgiston did indeed exist. He claims that my former husband, Antoine Lavoisier, had extracted it from water in his experiments with gases. He calls it inflammable air. Richard Kerwain and the rest of those who held on to the caloric theory were fools. It was hydrogen gas, not this imaginary substance phlogiston, that Lavoisier had extracted from water along with vital air, or as Madame Lavoisier calls it, oxygen. When put to the flame, these elements are again combined to form water, and heat energy is released. And just as importantly, the amount of water produced is exactly the same as that which was decomposed to produce these gases. My former husband and I had carried out this experiment with very careful measurements. Matter is not destroyed or created, only separated or combined, and water cannot be an element. It is composed of two different gases. We are observing reactions between elements and the transformation of energy. The direction of science was corrected. We now knew that we need to understand the chemistry of matter and the physics of energy. This would lead to great progress and inventions I could not ever have imagined. We are indebted to the great minds that came before us, Galileo, Copernicus, Newton, and the lesser knowns. And if we add but a single truth to human knowledge, we will be owed a debt by those who come after us. For if we see further, it is because we stand on the shoulders of giants.